Today on the John Ankerberg Show, is there scientific evidence for life after death? Numerous studies have been performed to evaluate the accounts of people who have been pronounced clinically dead when their doctors saw no heartbeat, that is no EKG, or no brain activity, that is no EEG, or both. Yet after a while, the patient amazingly returned to life with some fantastic accounts of where they had been and what they had seen and heard. Some saw and heard people say and do things five states away, but their material physical bodies never left the room where the doctors pronounced them dead. Many do not realize that between nine and 20 million Americans have reported near-death experiences according to the 2017 book, The Science of Near-Death Experiences by the prestigious University of Missouri Press, a highly acclaimed book that is the world's first peer-reviewed series on the science and medical aspects of NDEs by medical professionals. Such experiences compel scientists to ask, is there more to our lives than just our material bodies? If so, what is it? What happens when a person has a sense that their mind or consciousness is functioning apart from their physical body? Or when their consciousness is in the vicinity of their physical body and then goes and sees and hears things 1,250 miles away? Is it proof that after our material bodies die, we still continue to exist somewhere? If so, where do we go? In our three program series with Dr. Gary Habermas, he reveals stories and statistics that point to a spiritual realm. And since Jesus died and physically rose again, where does he say we will go when we die? Dr. Habermas takes us through six levels of near-death experiences, from near-death experiences in the ambulance to near-death experiences from the congenitally blind people who see something real, like colors people are wearing, to heart death, to brain death, and eventually to irreversible biological death experiences. So join us for this special edition of The John Ackerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ackerberg. Thanks for joining me. My guest, as you've just heard, is Dr. Gary Habermas, and he is uh, one of the most uh, well-known scholars on the resurrection, and he's tracking over 4,000 scholars in the world at some of the most prestigious universities and institutions of higher learning that we've got, okay? Not only here, but around, in different countries around the world. And out of the 4,000, he's taken the 2,000 most influential, and he is tracking what they say about Jesus and the resurrection, the factual basis that we've been talking about in other programs. We're not gonna talk about all right here but he's been tracking what they've said. 95% of them agree on what he's been saying. And he's got what he calls 12 minimal facts about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus that we've talked about that they agree with, okay? Now, we're taking the fact of what we've been talking about in the resurrection, and we're going to those folks, those skeptics, brilliant people who say, yeah, I can't I can't disagree with the data, the, the evidence that you're giving me from history, from the creeds, from everything we, we know about Jesus' life that we've studied all this time. We can't disagree with that, but I just, uh, I'm like the person that says, I went out with this beautiful woman and she, she'd be perfect for me to marry, but uh, I just don't want to get married, okay? And you know, Jesus fits the bill. If you want to believe him, the evidence is there. I just don't want to. And to those people, we're talking about another category that you need to consider, okay? Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist, said there's two things that atheists don't want to talk about. One, does God exist? And number two, is there an afterlife, okay? And we're talking about is there an afterlife? And is this thing called near-death experiences providing data that we ought to be aware of? And you have said that uh, in a prestigious book, they said that between nine 
and 20 million Americans have had near-death experiences. Okay? Now, you have been cataloging these things, and scientifically, as we've gone down through the years, the medical community has come up with levels here of uh, what, is, what is called death, okay? And give me the five stages. So we go from near death, which is at the bottom, to you're dead in a doornail, you're not coming back, okay? What happens in between? Uh, the second one up from the bottom would be heart death. The third one up from the bottom would be brain death. And the fourth one is irreversible biological death. Okay. So that's the key. All right, we're up to what number now? We're doing the third category up from the bottom, which is NDEs and the blind. All right, <clears throat> now we're talking about blind people that are on a table someplace and the doctors are working on them and they have a near-death experience where they go out of the room or they're in the room or they go someplace and they are blind, but they, in this case, can see and they see things and they come back and they re they're revived somehow and they continue to live and they can tell you what they saw. They're still blind, okay? Give me a couple examples. Yeah, probably the best one in this category. Well, I'll, I'll give you two. One is a, uh, a, a sightless person from a birth who was given a gift and the gift was a tie. Somebody gave them a tie, and when they had the near-death experience, the uh, tie was still sitting there, and they saw the tie for the first time, as opposed to unwrapping it and feeling it. They saw the tie, and they were able to give uh, a pretty minute description of how the colors went in and out, what kind of design was on the tie, and then, of course, went back to not seeing anything after that. A more detailed one from a person who was blind was from a woman whose two best friends had preceded her in death. All three were blind. But, and this has been published in more than one place, um, she had a near-death experience, a pretty, a pretty involved one, and she saw both of her friends for what seemed like seconds or a minute before she, kinda, before she came back. Now, she'd been best friends with these people, and when you're blind, you know, you, you can feel somebody's face, you can feel a contour, you can have somebody even say, uh, another blind person could say, oh, my hair is not, it's kind of, you know, clogged up, I need to comb this, or whatever. You can hear descriptions that you can get a word picture for, but she saw her friends for the first time. So she noticed contours and things about their face that she never knew about them before because they're not the kind of things that you would talk about. Uh, a small mole over here or something that caught her attention. And she came back and reported what both of the young ladies looked like. Now again, you can know what your best friend looks like, but when you see them for the first time, inevitably something different is going to be reported that you'd never picture them having before that. You know, uh, darker skin than you thought, lighter skin than you thought, uh, younger looking, or you look way too young for your age, or, you know, whatever. And that was the case with her. Yeah. So the next category is the first of the two of what I call the Twilight Zone cases. And I, I should say something here at the beginning. Um, I'm giving some of the sources for these things, but I'm... What, what often India who give reports do, I'm changing some of the circumstances just a little bit so as to uh, protect the anonymity of anybody who doesn't want their story getting out there. So I'm trying to be very yeah. selective. You've had but, how many that you've been involved with yourself personally that you've tracked? Uh, where I've talked to the person personally, dozens, but I've collected over 100 evidential cases that go across the, all the categories. Okay, so you yourself have been involved in tracking some I have been involved, and I've interviewed the people. And you know what? We started out our first program on NDs with two kind of categories. The ones that were really impressive, the woman who didn't want to come back to see her newly born child, that impresses people in a way that is different than the way you're impressed with evidence. Um, I have been over and over in my own interviews, I'm very impressed with people who tell certain private things that are not evidential, but when you hear them, you think, 
that would affect me for the rest of my life. So a lot of them are that kind too. Yeah, I want to, uh, before you move on, I, I like that thing because you really haven't uh, described this, but I don't know if you would say it's the majority, but one of the characteristics of near-death experiences, at least for Christians, okay, the, the ones that have the good experiences, we've had hell experiences as well, okay, in this thing. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about that, but just a little bit. Uh, the thing is, the Christians that have had some of these experiences, when you ask them, would you want to come back to be with your new baby? Would you want to be back with your family? And she loves her family, but they all say, no, I'll let my husband take care of them because where I'm at, I'd rather stay there. Now, that's really an interesting comment, and you get this from multiple uh, witnesses that have had this kind of uh, near-death right. experiences. But they will often add, when you say, wouldn't you have been worried about them? They'd say, you know what? After being at that place and seeing the symmetry of life, I was sure that whatever worked out, it would come out in the end. In other words, they were making a comment on the problem of suffering, that I know things will work out in the end, which is, which is a teleological expression of why I don't have to worry about them back on earth. It's like C.S. Lewis. He described in one of his little books the fact of, of people seeing colors in a deeper way, a more uh, real way if yes. you want. Yes. Talk about that book. What was yeah, the title? It's fantastic. And that's again back to my, have you ever been to Narnia? Have you ever seen Oz question? Because in C.S. Lewis's little book, The Weight of Glory, his famous sermon that he preached in Oxford, he says, we revel in colors, but how would you like to be in the color so fully that you're part of the color? Or you hear music. Instead of hearing the music out there, you're part of the symphony. And I think his point is, who knows? C.S. Lewis, you, you know, when he describes way, uh, his uh, autobiography, Surprised by Joy, he talks about what sounds exactly like a near-death experience in a trench in World War I. So he probably had one, but people, that, that's very, very common. They'll have these experiences and they'll say, I've just got to tell you, the colors there are, well, they're deeper than, never mind, you won't understand, you got to be there. And they always do that. It's not evidential, you're just listening to them. But that, that sermon is so good because he says, I want to imbibe, I want to smell, I want to be part of it. And it's like, Wow, that's yeah. a great life. All right, let's go back to these uh, kind of yep. like Twilight Zone yep. experiences. These, these are just unbelievable experiences. Yeah, Raymond Moody tells one in the category of healthy people who observe somebody else's NDE. All right, there's a case he describes where a very elderly mother slash grandmother is in a hospital bed or in a bed at home, and she's surrounded by, I believe, five of her family members. And she's come to the end of her life and she's lived a very good life. And everyone's sad, but they're sorry she's suffering so much. And you know, it, it's, it's time, you know, so people are dealing with this. And all of a sudden, she's lying peacefully on the bed. And all of a sudden, she sits up. Only she doesn't sit up. Her body is still back on the pillow. But what looks like uh, a spirit, kind of a wispy, and they're looking around the room and they're going, and they see a light over her bed, a, a, a spinning orb, and again, they don't want to talk, and they're going, and the orb elongates into a tunnel, and grandma, spiritual grandma, she smiles, she sees it, and she's so excited, and they watch as she comes up out of the, presumably out of her body, and she starts going up this, this tunnel, and they're all looking and watching, 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 and it disappears. Now, if that's true, she looks like she's the one going to Narnia, but they got to see over the divide, and they got to see, it's like Moses, you know, he couldn't get into the promised land, but he could look over. Mm -hmm. uh, they got a chance to look, and they were so happy because Grandma looked so pleased. And in this case, she actually did die then. She did die. Okay, yes. but you're saying these people watched it. 
they, five healthy people watched grandma go. Wow. And they were all too happy to have the funeral because it was a joyous occasion. Yeah. I, I find this very interesting that the Christians that have these wonderful experiences do not fear death anymore. And it, it reminds me of the disciples that it seemed like they didn't care about this category of death. They all knew they probably would die, and they all did except John. The fact that they were all martyred in gruesome ways, but people that talked about them, their friends, the apostolic fathers that talked about, oh, I knew them, you know, and Peter didn't feel this, and Paul didn't think that was a serious thing at all. They did not fear death at all. They kind of looked forward to That's it. That's right. Now, in Paul's case, many Bible commentators, New Testament scholars, believe Paul had a near-death experience. And, and the interesting thing is, some of the older commentaries before NDEs were anything, and the comment uh, be, by people who don't think much of NDEs, but they'll say in the commentary, they'll say, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul says he visited the third heaven, he says it was 14 years ago. You know, chronologically, this is the person talking, they'll say chronologically, that works out to just about the time when he would have been stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra. So maybe he had, and back then when they're writing this up, it's like maybe he had one of those visions where people saw not knowing. Now, if Paul had had one of those, now I ask if 2 Corinthians 12 was a near-death experience, if it was. I mean, Stephen looks up to heaven, right. sees Jesus sees on the Jesus. right hand of God, time of going up the tunnel. So, so I'm wondering if Paul had that, does that cause Paul, he sees the resurrected Jesus, so real he's blinded, he has an NDE, he had, a, he had a twofer, right? He had two of these. Does that allow him to write my favorite verses, Philippians 1, 21 and 23, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, as I say to a lot of people, to live as Christ makes a good message. You don't hear a lot of preaching on to die is gain, but then two verses later he says, I prefer to die and be with Christ, which is, and there's an emphatic Greek expression here, which is often translated, I prefer to die and be with Christ, which is better, comma, far better. So I wonder if having looked over, that's what NDEers say, far better. Now, now, confessedly, he may have gotten that from the trip to Damascus and, and knowing Jesus is in another realm, and he got to see him briefly before he was blinded. But um, yeah, I think these guys know what's going on. How, how many of the others were, were stoned and left for dead or things happened and they also knew about it, but they were sure convinced of the other reality. All right, give me another extreme, extreme example that was tracked of a near-death experience. Well, the last category is where the person who has it is near death but they report data from somebody who is irreversibly dead and you'll never see him again in this world. And there's a number of those. Now the example I gave, hate to tell you this, but your cousin was just killed in Afghanistan and, and you're gonna hear about that. You know, the, the person you might meet, <clears throat> it's not Jesus for sure, but I just thought as I said that, look at when uh, Jesus took Peter aside and said, they're going to come and take you in a way, John 21, where you don't want to be taken. He predicted the death by which Peter would die. To, to uh, And then Peter, just reading last night, where Peter says, this tent's going to be, uh, it's going to be taken from me pretty soon. I'm going to be, as, my, as the Lord told me. So when someone says, you're going to get a telegram and it, and it happens, or sometimes not quite the same as near-death experiences, but what sometimes are referred to as post-death visions, where somebody gets a 10 second meeting with somebody the day of the funeral. There are a number of stories where they're sitting there in the person's home and everyone's gonna be getting their cars and going home the next day and the funeral was today. And there are a number of stories where three of them are in the living room, five of them are in the living room, and the wife, the grandmother, appears in the room briefly for five seconds and someone says, are you really here? And sometimes they don't even talk and they walk, walk over and pick up a hairbrush and walks over and drops it in their lap. And everybody sees the person move an object or just the fact that more than one has seen them. But the point is, they don't ever come back. So they're irreversibly dead. So those sorts of Twilight Zone dad, there's a famous case where in one of those where the fellow saw his dad, the family had been trying to solve a will 
um, but they couldn't find the writing. Dad had put it somewhere and nobody could find it. When the son sees his dad, the son comes back from the near-death experience, dad told him it was sewn into the inner pocket of one of his coats. Hopefully they didn't throw it away and they hadn't. And they found it and they got the, they got the document out. So the, the key is that the person who gives the information is irreversibly dead. Some of these are two years, most of them are two, three, five, but occasionally you get a 10 or a 15. I know one that was 49 years mm -hmm. later. The Have been person, dead for 49 years. The person was dead for 49 years. It was his mother, and she died in childbirth. And before he was old enough to walk and talk, his father had already remarried. So mom's pictures were all out of the house, and the new wife, by that time, w the pictures were in the house. And when he had a near-death experience and say, said, I met my mom, the aunt, who understood that her sister's pictures had not been around the house because her brother-in-law had remarried, she came over with a family album and said, which one did you see? And he picked his mother out of the book, but they didn't talk about his mother, only to keep things, you know, so that was another one, but she'd been dead for 49 years. This man yeah. had a heart attack, and so he was presumably 49 years old. All right, what do skeptics do with this kind of evidence? I hope they're uneasy. Mm-hmm. But I hope hey, what do they, what do they say? Them, what do they say in their magazines and articles and so on? Oh, they'll just usually say things like, "Oh, it's a bunch of baloney." Here, here's the big objection in your death experiences. They'll say, "It's hearsay." It's hearsay, or they'll say, "We've had experiments, and this is true." There's a number of hospitals around the world, Western Europe and the U.S., North America where they put computers up in the rafters and they're saying, well, if you were up above your body, what was that random five digit number that keeps floating around there? And nobody's ever reported the number yet. But now there really is a story about a penny. There really is a story about a quarter. You didn't tell the story about the lady that went and looked at the top of something. I just realized that one too. And it's in the same book by Jan Holden that I mentioned earlier. This, this woman is up above her body and she says, you know, I'm obsessive compulsive. I have OCD. And she said, I looked down on the top of a medical machine that was six to eight feet tall, and they, the hospital rivets numbers so they can keep track of all their things, and it was on the top. So having OCD, she said, I have a habit of memorizing long numbers. And there was a 12-digit number riveted on the top of the machine, and when she comes to, she says to the nurse, she says, write this down. The number is 367432, and the nurse writes it down and puts it away. Well, a couple days later, they came to get that machine to take it back out, and the nurse said, whoa, 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 let me look. Number's exactly right, 12 numbers. So, I mean, that's another one, 12 numbers at random from up by the ceiling. Okay, what do you want the person that does not know Jesus, has not thought about spiritual thing, has not thought there's an afterlife, what do you want them to walk away with from what we've said today? I would say, before you even look at resurrection, if there's an afterlife, you're playing Russian roulette if you don't, exa if you don't check into it and see what does this mean for me. Because if there's an afterlife, especially things that point to a worldview that goes with it, God, intelligent design, ethics, this is part of a system I need to know more about the world. But now, if I look at NDEs and I look at the resurrection too, Jesus is looking really, really good to me. I know a, a very well-known skeptic. I, I know him. I've had hours of conversation with him. And it's the NDE thing that brought him to believe in the resurrection. He thinks the evidence for the resurrection is great, but he's, he's a serious skeptic. But he thinks the resurrection is great, but he's convinced because he came there through the NDE. So I think it's a door to evidence, and I think it should be something that at least makes us open to data open to what keys are you carrying around with and what doors are you trying to lock with this data. If it leads to Narnia, if it leads to the uh, yellow brick road and the Emerald City, um, hopefully I think that would, would be the outcome of this, that somebody would be so challenged by the data that would it would make them want to take a look at their life and consider living differently. Yeah. Uh, folks, I'll just leave you with this. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Jesus is the only religious leader that gave you evidence that he can pull that off if you put your trust and belief in him. 
Gary, thank you for being with us and giving us all this great information. Thank you. Had a great time. Yeah. And uh, folks, stay tuned. I've got a personal word for you. Do you think that there is scientific evidence for life after death? Numerous scientific studies have been performed to evaluate the accounts of people who have been pronounced clinically dead. Yet surprisingly, some people have returned to life with amazing accounts of where they had been and what they had seen and heard. But their material, physical bodies never left the room where the doctors pronounced them dead. Such experiences compel scientists to ask, is there more to our lives than just our physical bodies? Is it proof that after our material bodies die, we continue to exist somewhere? If so, where? And since Jesus died and physically rose again, where does he say we will go after we die? The three programs in this series are called, Is There Scientific Evidence for Life After Death? And it's available on DVD for a gift of $39. And then second, for the past century, secular historians have argued that the resurrection and deity of Jesus were teachings developed by Christians long after Jesus lived. But now there is evidence that shows within 24 months of his crucifixion, many historical facts and beliefs about Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection were known by early Christians and passed along to others. This evidence is found in early sermon summaries or belief statements of Christians called creedal statements. And we present this evidence in our two programs with Dr. Gary Habermas called, What Did Christians Believe Within 24 Months of Jesus' Resurrection? And it's available on DVD for a gift of $29. And then third, we're making available our recent series called The Historical Evidence for the Resurrection that even skeptics believe. Dr. Habermas explains why the majority of 4,000 critical New Testament scholars now agree on 12 historical facts about the deity, death, and resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. The five programs in this important series are available on DVD for a gift of $49. And finally, you may order all three of these series together, containing all 10 TV programs, for just $99 or you may order any one of these three series by themselves. But to order now, call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may order these series at our website at jashow.org.